a classic love story. A young man heads off to a prestigious university. He meets the woman of his dreams and falls madly in love. Three months later, they're married and soon welcome a baby girl named Nettie. But this story has a powerful twist. See, that new father was none other than Frederick Douglass III, the great-grandson of Frederick Douglass, the father of civil rights. That proud new mom's name is also Nettie, as in Nettie Hancock Washington, granddaughter of Booker T. Washington, educator and founder of the Tuskegee University the institute where they met. That small child, Nettie Washington Douglas, was the first to unite two historic bloodlines. Ken Morris, the second to do so, is proud to call her mom. Driven by what he deeply believes to be his calling, Ken has become a powerful voice in the campaign to end human trafficking and servitude with a clear focus on the restoration of dignity and well-being to its victims. Good evening. My name is Lanisha DeBartolabin, and I am president and CEO of the Northwest African American Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you virtually to our incredible program that focuses on the heritage and legacy of notable black visionaries by introducing you to their descendants. We are thrilled to host Kenneth Morris Jr., great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass and great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. You'll learn how he descended from two of the most important historical figures in black history. This history is not told in history books. NAM's Descendants series is an educational experience that provides information that will inspire and empower you to learn more about your own ancestry and genealogy. When you discover who you are and the legacy you come from, it fosters community building and creates a deep sense of belonging and purpose. NAM's Descendants series is meant to highlight the bold and brave legacy of our past and inspire future generations to come. Before we get into the program, I would like to introduce you to tonight's moderator, Kiantha Duncan. Kiantha is president of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP and has a 20-year history of philanthropy and management of nonprofit organizations' programs and supporting historically marginalized communities. She was recently a program officer for the Family Resiliency Portfolio at the Empire Health Foundation, leaving that position to focus on writing a book on leadership and working as a consultant in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Kiantha is an accomplished community builder and organizer who has experience bringing people together to have challenging conversations and develop solutions for problems facing our region and our society. Please join me in welcoming Kiantha Duncan, and we hope you enjoy tonight's program. Thank you, Lanisha. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Northwest African American Museum. We have a precious, and I do mean precious, opportunity to partake in conversation tonight with Mr. Kenneth Morris Jr., whose DNA intersects with two of the most notable figures in Black history, Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass. First, we'll deal with his Booker T. Washington ancestry. Kenneth is the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington the great, great grandson, the first leader of the Tuskegee Institute, whose message of self-sufficiency still stands 141 years later, educating generations of leaders. Secondly, Kenneth is, as if that wasn't enough, Kenneth is the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass. Yes, that Frederick Douglass, the one who rose from his childhood, warming his feet by the ashes to become a notable abolitionist, a renowned publisher of the North Star newspaper, 
and the first African-American vice president candidate in 1872. As the heir of these two luminaries, Kenneth carries the mantle as co-founder and president of the New York-based nonprofit Frederick Douglass Family Initiative with a mission of building strong children and ending systems of exploitation and oppression. Among his many accolades, Kenneth has served as a keynote speaker at the United Nations and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's annual, annual conference in Luxembourg. He has appeared on CNN, Democracy Now!, PBS, NPR, Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien, the CBS yeah, Evening News, and in numerous historical documentaries. He received an honorary doctorate of human letters degree from the University of Laverne in California and was named as the first man to be awarded the 21st Century Ida B. Wells Award for Bravery in Journalism News. He was also appointed to the Frederick Douglass um, Bicentennial Commission, serving as the commission's chair by Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi. Kenneth has a commitment to promoting social change through activism and that addresses contemporary social issues. As Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, he firmly believes that education is the pathway to freedom. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Kenneth Morris, Jr. Hello. Hi, Ms. Piazza. Morris, listen, I could talk about your accolades for about 14 days. <laughs> Well, we wouldn't want to do that, I don't think. <laughs> I'm telling you. So we have to start this conversation by me saying the resemblance of you and your great, great grandfather is uncanny. I'm very proud of that. I've heard that a, a few times in, in my life. And, you know, he was a, a, a striking man. So I take that as a, a compliment. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm so happy to see you today and have a chance to have a conversation about the history of your family uh, and your work as a descendant of two very, very strong men in Black history and American history. Mm -hmm. So first, let me ask you this. So we're just going to get to the stuff that the people really want to hear first. <laughs> okay. All tell right. us about your descendant's story. So tell us the origin of your descendant so that people are clear on who's who, on what side. Right. Well, it happened on my mother's side of the family. All of it is on my mother's side. So my mother's mother, Nettie Hancock Washington, was Booker T. Washington's granddaughter. And my mother's father, Frederick Douglass III, was Frederick Douglass's great grandson. My grandparents met in 1941 at Tuskegee Normal School and Institute, which is a school that Booker T. Washington founded in 1881 at the age of 25. My grandparents were on campus the same day. Now, my grandfather had been commissioned down to Tuskegee by the Veterans Administration during World War II. He was a surgeon. My grandmother had been born on campus at the hospital there, but she was living in California at the time, and she just happened to be home for summer vacation. And so they found themselves on campus the same day. My, my grandmother's rushing across to meet friends, and my grandfather decided this one evening he was going to eat in the student cafeteria, which he had never eaten there before. They had their own cafeteria. And so if you can get this visual of these two people, my grandmother rushing across, my grandfather walking, and they literally bumped into each other, didn't know that the other descended from an historic family, and they fell in love at first sight and wound up getting married just three months later. And so when my mother, Nettie Washington Douglas, was born, she was the first person to unite the bloodlines of these historic families, and she was an only child. So when I was born, I had the honor and privilege and the blessing to be the first male in the family to, to carry that dual lineage. And so that's how the families came together. And perhaps it was meant to be that they their paths would cross. So I, I am thinking just from what I've heard so far, you sound like royalty to me, <laughs> but I'm sure your family treats you like you are the bee's knees because you <laughs> are the first. <laughs> so that carries a lot of weight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, <laughs> my great grandmother uh, certainly... Uh, treated me like the bee's knees. And I think that growing up in, in this type of family, you know, it was something that I really did take for granted. You know, I was born into it and I don't really think I received any kind of special treatment growing up. So um, I don't know about the bee's knees, but it certainly uh, was fun to grow up in this family for sure. 
So tell me this. I know all of our viewers and listeners uh, who will see this broadcast at a later time want to understand this. And I've done this, this series with a couple of descendants, and this question comes up all the time. At what age did you find out that you were a descendant of these major figures? So was it in kindergarten? Was it, you know, did you always know since birth yeah. or was it the day? And do you remember the day that you were told that it happened? There was never really a time when somebody came to me when I was younger and said, Kenny, you need to sit down. There's something really important we have to tell you. I just have always known. I grew up in my uh, summer family summer beach house, was, which was built by my great great grandfather, Charles, who was Frederick and Anna Murray Douglas's youngest son. Charles purchased 40 acres on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland at a place called Highland Beach that he founded. And he parceled those properties off, but he kept one for his his family to build a home and for his brother and then for his father, Frederick. And he asked his dad, he said, are there any special features that you want in the house? And Frederick said, yes, I want it to point in a certain direction. I want it to be on the water and I want you to build a tower at the top. And what he wanted to do at the end of his life in retirement was to sit in that tower and look back across the Chesapeake Bay back across the water because on the other side you could see land and the land is the eastern shore of Maryland where he had been born into slavery with the name Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. And so I spent all of my summers in that beach house and there were images of my ancestors in every room. And I was probably about, oh, I guess maybe five or six when I started to notice that they were on statues and I saw them on money. <laughs> And, right. <laughs> kind of important. <laughs> kind of important. Yeah. And, and postage stamps and schools were named for them, bridges and libraries. And I would ask my, my friends and my classmates, are, are your grandparents on statues? And uh, they would respond, no. <laughs> and so that was really when I started to really feel kind of this weight of expectation and that perhaps I was living in this shadow, this long, vast shadow of these two great and influential American heroes. Now tell me a little bit more about the house because now I'm so fascinated with that. Was the tower still in the house at the time that you were a child there? It was in the house and it's still in the house. The house still exists. It's, it's an historic landmark now. But in that tower, I remember again being a boy and sitting at the knee of my great grandmother, Fanny Douglas, who was married to Frederick Douglass's grandson, Joseph. And my great grandmother lived to be 103 years old and she met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl, when she was probably about eight or nine years old. And she didn't know at the time that she was going to grow up and marry his grandson, but that's what happened. But I remember her telling me about him and she would say things like, he had this great big white hair and he had a great smile and he was just um, really kind of an imposing figure. And she, until the end of her life, she talked about his great big white hair. And then um, in the same vein, I remember sitting at the knee of my Aunt Portia, who was Booker T. Washington's daughter, and she lived to be about 95. And when we started our work at the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives in 2007, I remember being with a group of students. They were fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and they were all looking at me kind of cross-eyed and like, man, why are you talking about these people that lived so long ago? And, and what does that have to do with our lives today? And I was trying to give them some context to help them wrap their minds around the distance between the generations and that I'm not that far removed. And I had this thought that I think was kind of profound. And I said to them, I said, you know, hands that touch the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touch the great Booker T. Washington also touch mine. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, even with all of those greats, I can say I stand one person away from each man. I stand one person away from history and I stand one person away from slavery. And so those memories of sitting in the tower with my great grandmother and her talking about, you know, meeting Frederick Douglass are, are really special. And of course, at the time I'm a kid, I don't really appreciate it in the same way that I do now. So lo learning your own family history. OK, because now I'm imagining that I'm you. <laughs> and, what, and what kind of pressure I would be under just to, yeah. you know, show up in a way that honors both those sides of my family. How have you carved out your own space and your own path in this world, uh, knowing that you have great, great grandparents that are literally on money, as you said, um, named after bridges, statues? How did you find your own space? 
You know, it really was a long journey uh, to find my own space. And I, I talk about it quite a bit. Again, we spend a lot of time in schools with students and they're always asking me all of these great questions. And, you know, I, I really was what I call decisively disengaged from my lineage. And I, I took it for granted when I was younger. I, I saw what the pressure had done to those that came before me that would try and live up to or walk in the shoes of these great figures. And it's obviously a very difficult task to try and do that. And, you know, the few times that I told people of my relationship when I was younger, nobody ever believed me. You know, they would say things like, well, yeah, I'm related to Abraham Lincoln then if you're related to Frederick Douglass. Well, because listen, Shaka Khan is my auntie right now. Okay. <laughs> 2022, she is my aunt and nobody can convince me otherwise. That's right. Well, and nobody <laughs> believes me either. So yeah, I would imagine that was hard to prove. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and you're younger and, and I had a few instances where I had teachers uh, that didn't believe me. And there was one story that, that I remember um, and it just is really just stuck in my mind my whole life. And I was in kindergarten and we were asked to go home and bring something from our family tree and to tell the story of our family. And my teacher didn't know the connection that I had at that time. And so I went to my mom and I said, you know, I've got to do this project. I need to go in and talk about my family. What, what can I bring? And she runs into her bedroom and goes under her bed and she comes out and she is carrying this cane. And oh, she please. hands me the cane. And of course, I asked, well, what is this? And she said, well, that's Abraham Lincoln's cane. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, Not even your great granddad, but Abraham Lincoln's cane. Abraham Lincoln's cane, which I, I found out uh, was given to him when uh, President Lincoln was assassinated. It was given to Frederick by Mary Todd Lincoln as a token of appreciation of the friendship that they had developed. And so it was passed down in the family. And my mom talks about uh, doing inventory every year and pulling out the cane and putting it on the bed. And my brother, who was a toddler, would chew on the end of the cane. <laughs> and and my, my great grandmother, you know, said, Douglas, my brother's name is Douglas. Don't don't chew on that. Don't chew on that cane. And, and my other my grandmother said, oh, leave that boy alone. He knows what he's doing. That's Abraham Lincoln's cane. And so my mom gave it to me and she said, take it to school. And I said, mom, I can't take this to school. People don't even believe me when I say I'm related. And you expect me to walk in and, and say, this is Abraham Lincoln's cane. And she said, oh, go on, go on, you'll be okay. <laughs> so I went to school and a little bit later that afternoon, she got a call from the principal and said, "You know, we've got Kenny in our office and he seems to have um, an issue with telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know what happened after that? Mom went down to school and everything got straightened out. But again, being a kid and having people not believe you when you talk about it. So I didn't I didn't talk about it my whole life. And just to get back to your original question, um, I was running away from it. I started my own business. I had an advertising and marketing company and we catered to the travel industry. I spent some time in the entertainment industry as, as a singer. I got married and had two beautiful daughters, and, and now I'll, I'll be celebrating 38 years of marriage next month. So I was happy to be a husband and a father and a business owner, go to church, and don't talk to me about any of this stuff. And all of that changed in 2005 when I, I read a National Geographic magazine, and the cover story was 21st century slaves. And it was an article about human trafficking and modern day slavery existing all over the world, including right here in the United States. And that really just shocked me. I'd heard about trafficking and sex trafficking in far off places, but really didn't make the connection to it being modern day slavery and happening here in the United States. And so I wanted to learn more about the issue. And there was one night that I was sitting in my um, living room and I was reading another article about a 12 year old girl who was forced to be a sex slave in the brothels of Southeast Asia and service countless men almost every single day. And down the hallway, I could hear my daughters getting ready for bed. And my older daughter was 12. So she was the same age as this girl that I was reading about. And my younger daughter was nine and they're laughing and playing and about to get down on their knees to say their prayers. And, and my mind just starts going crazy and I can't wrap my brain ar around what I'm reading and what I'm hearing. And I, I remember thinking to myself that that's what young girls and boys should be doing is getting tucked safely into bed and not being forced to service some sick individual. 
And when I walked in to say goodnight to them, I had this moment where I couldn't look them in the eyes. I didn't feel like I could look them in the eyes and walk away and not do something about this. And it was almost immediately that everything just started, you know, just boiling, boiling up inside of me. And I understood that I had this platform that my ancestors had built through struggle and through sacrifice. And perhaps we could leverage the historical significance of my ancestry to do something about this. And about a year later, my mom and I started the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. And our mission uh, was to bring human trafficking prevention education to uh, K through 12 school children. And that's really the first time that I started to embrace this. But I think that because I found the mission on my own, it's more meaningful than it would have been had it been forced on me. So there's a couple things. One, congratulations on being married 38 years. <laughs> Thank you. I think that makes you a superstar too in 2022. <laughs> so congratulations and happy um, anniversary to you and your wife. Please give her my regards. Thank um, you. But also before we get a little bit deeper into what you ended up doing, I want to talk about this. Do you think that there was anything that was invested or implanted in you even before your birth because of who your grandparents were. Do you think that that was the thing that woke up when you read that article that day? Or did did it just really come from nowhere? Because I kind of believe that it's in you already, right? So it's waiting to be awakened. And that article might have just awakened this spirit that has already been there from your, your ancestors. That That's a beautiful question. And I, I tend to agree with you, you know, the blood of our, our ancestors, all of our ancestors flows through our veins and, and it's in our DNA. And so I would agree that it was probably there um, laying dormant, just being uh, ready to be awakened. And then when I also look back at my career, my business career, my entertainment career, and just everything I had done, it was, I could look back in retrospect and see that I was being prepared to do this work. And perhaps it took a little longer for me to finally find it than it might have been uh, for someone else. But I, I tend to agree with you that it's it's in our blood. And, um, you know, I, I remember stories that had been passed down. And of course, again, I didn't always take those stories um, you know, I, it, so seriously when when they were being told to me. And, and I think we all can look back and and remember a grandmother or a great grandmother, a great grandfather and say, man, I wish we would have asked them more questions when, when they were alive about our family, our family history and our family tree. So I, I, I believe that it was always in me. And it was just that article that it was time to, to start really embracing it. So as the voice of the family initiative, I know that people often get to hear from you and your story, but tell me a little bit about your mom too, because you said you started this initiative with your mom. So let us know who is your mom and, and tell us, you know, her story and, and how she has adapted in this world being a descendant of two great men. My mom is a remarkable woman, as you could probably um, imagine and guess. She's been carrying the torch and the legacy uh, since she was a, a little girl. I, I remember just about a month or so ago seeing a, a photograph of her and she probably wasn't even two years old yet. And she was at the uh, Booker T. Washington um, National Historic Site in Virginia, and she was actually there for the groundbreaking of that. And I remember seeing a photo of her um, taking the first Booker T. Washington um, 50 cent piece off of the mint in, hand, in San Francisco and handing that to Joe DiMaggio. And so she was carrying this legacy and this, this weight of expectation in her own right. Um, I will say, and, and I don't always share this because it's such a um, a personal, painful part of our family history. But my grandfather that I talked about, who was the surgeon, he was a brilliant man. He was a namesake of Frederick Douglass. He, he, people expected him to be an iconic leader uh, like his great grandfather. And he always walked around with this heavy weight on his shoulders. When my grandmother was three months pregnant with my mom, that weight became too much to carry and he took his own life. And so my mother was born without a father and raised without a father. And then when I came along with this dual lineage, my parents and grandparents and great grandparents went in the complete opposite direction and they weren't going to force anything around, force anything on me and really kind of put up this protective shield or bubble to protect me from these very formidable legacies. And so my mom, you know, I think that 
when she started to have children in addition to uh, me, um, I have a younger brother and a younger sister that she'll tell you she became a full-time mom and, and that was her job was to, to raise us. But then when we started doing this work and, and she would occasionally, she would go into schools and, and do assemblies and, and she always loves talking to students. So she would continue to do that. But she was so proud when we started the organization and she just looks on and I, I have an opportunity to do a lot of things with her now, which I really enjoy. We get to travel together. Uh, we've been to Ireland together just a couple of months ago. We were in Rochester, New York for the new mayor's inaugural ball. And, and so she gets to really enjoy the legacy now. And I, 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 I kind of tease her and say, you know, you're like the queen of England That's because right. she loves to go and, you know, do all of these formal events and meet and greet and represent the family, which she still does incredibly well. Well, tell her that we do see her as a queen. And so yes, <laughs> she will. gets to be the queen wherever you go. <laughs> uh, I think you you said something that to me feels really powerful, more so than it just being that um, your great, great grandfather committed suicide. I think that what's more important is that people don't always recognize that when Black people who are um, who are known in in history for you know literally doing things that change the world? They don't realize the weight that also comes along with that recognition. So we're in 2022, you know, sort of celebrating your mm -hmm. great great grandparents, but nobody talks about really the the challenge that also was there for them and the ways in which those heavy burdens and heavy weights um, affected their lives. And so thank you for sharing that with us because I'm sure. People didn't know that. So, yeah. And if I could just add to that, because you, you really bring up a, a great point. And I, I remember, you know, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American of the 19th century. He was photographed more than Abraham Lincoln, more than Ulysses S. Grant, more than General Custer. And his only contemporaries that were photographed more than he was, was the British royal family. And that's because he understood that he could use this new technology that he would come of age with photography to help make his arguments for liberation and equality in addition to his oratory and to his writings. And so I, I remember looking at these photographs and we found 168 of them, which uh, we published in a book called Picturing Frederick Douglass in 2015. And the third photograph, he's not looking directly into the camera. And it caught this picture caught my eye because I knew that he was very intentional in the way he presented himself, he said, when you look at a picture of me, you're going to look me in the eyes and see my humanity. Uh, you're going to see a man that is worthy of freedom, worthy of citizenship. And he said, I never want to look like a happy, amiable fugitive slave because he was trying to counteract the notion in the public consciousness that people of African descent were not worthy of freedom and perhaps they were better off in slavery um, getting the Christian religion, listen to the happy songs that they sing. And so he was very intentional in the way that he just stared into that camera with that fiery gaze. And in this one photograph, he's not doing that. He's looking to the side. And when we were researching what happened around that time, we found a letter that he'd written to a fellow fugitive slave. And in it, he said, I felt so ugly today that I couldn't look myself in the glass. And what he was talking about was he couldn't look himself in the mirror. And it hit me instantly because I had always looked at him as this super hero with a cape and just this armor on. And I realized and thought about that he had been enslaved for the first 20 years of his life. And when he escaped from slavery with the help of my great, great, great grandmother, Anna Murray, there was no counseling. There was no post-traumatic stress disorder designation. And he would have to deal with the trauma of the brutality and the inhumanity and the exploitation that he had suffered for 20 years, he would have to deal with that on his own. Mm -hmm. And he spent many, he, he had, um, there were many times when he would be in bed for two weeks because he was just so ill and, and the work that he was doing, you know, to speak and be a mouthpiece for his brethren that were still enslaved. And so when you talk about, you know, what our ancestors went through, what they sacrificed and struggled through and endured, um, it makes it, I, I'm all the more proud of, of my ancestors for the work that they did. 
Absolutely. The other thing that came to my mind, just as you were saying that was right now, we know we have a name for, for childhood trauma, right? We know that it's ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. but there was no name for that. Although I would say that he was experiencing or had experienced all the ACEs as well. Right. So having been traumatized, having, you know, who knows what experiences on the plantation, you know, there was all of that. So I think you're right in that they carried all those things with them. And I, when I say they, I mean, even the folks that made humongous, humongous strides for Black people in America, they still carried all of that trauma with them and still did the great things that they did. And so that to me speaks to our, not just resiliency, that that's more than resiliency. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what to call it. It's more than resilient, but it is something that is beautiful and it is deep inside of us as African Americans. And so I, I celebrate that. And that's that's really good to hear that from from your perspective. Now another thing I want to go back because you keep giving me more questions that I want to ask. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about your great great grandfathers um, sort of being indoctrinated because we know that's what happened. The Christian church became sort of the the lead um, uh, lead faith education for slaves. And then you mentioned a little while ago that you were a very um, religious person as well. And that you were, you know, you were praying for the girls. They were praying before bed. You were going to church. Do you see religion in a different way than your grandfather might have seen it back then? You know, his his ideas on religion evolved from the time that he was, was enslaved as a boy you know, and, there, and there's a story that happened that was really important in his his life. And, and I'll take a minute just to share that with you, because it's also at the foundation of the work that we do at our organization. And that was he was chosen from among all of the children on the plantation on the eastern shore of Maryland to go to Baltimore to be the house servant for his master's family. And the importance of this move was he was leaving in an environment where he wasn't around people that could teach him to read and write, because as we know, from our US history, it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write. But now he was going to be in Baltimore. He would be around free black children and he would also be around poor white children. But what happened most importantly when he got there, his slave mistress, Sophia Auld, had never had a slave before. She didn't know that it was illegal to teach him. And she began out of the kindness of her Christian heart to teach young Frederick his ABCs. And that was all he really needed was that little spark of light into his mental bondage. And he knew right then and there that that education was going to be his pathway to freedom. And the lessons would continue for a little while until his enslaver, Hugh Ald, found out about him. And when he found out, he got angry and he looked at his wife and he looked at Frederick and he said, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write, because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. Hmm. He'll be running away with himself. And Frederick looked at his master and he he knew, he said, that's going to be my key to mm -hmm. emancipation, to liberation. And he would teach himself to read and write. And what the master predicted happened, he started to ask critical questions about his condition, like, why am I a slave? Right. And why do you own me? And he would turn to God and he would pray to God for deliverance from his bondage. And he would say, I don't understand how my master puts on a suit every Sunday and goes to church and in the word and, and scripture and cherry pick verses finds justification to brutalize, to humanize, rape, pillage, and plunder his property. And he's starting early on to make the distinction between what he would call, later call the slave holding Christianity of the land versus the pure, peaceable, impartial Christianity of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's really how his ideas on religion started. And then when he would teach himself to read one of the first books that he purchased was the Bible. And then he became a licensed preacher in the AME church, uh, really honing his skills while enslaved in Baltimore, speaking at the pulpit. And then when he would eventually run away from slavery, he would join up with the um, Garrisonians and the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society at a convention in Nantuck in Nantucket on Nantucket Island. And the Garrisonians heard that they had this fugitive in the audience and they asked Frederick, Will you just stand up and tell your story? And he wrote in his first autobiography, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. He said, I was so nervous that first time speaking in front of a white audience that I was shaking from every limb. But when he stood up, he had this natural gift for communication. He was eloquent. He was charismatic. He was theatrical. He was even funny in some of the descriptions when he would talk about the characters. 
that he came into contact with while enslaved. And I really do believe that he was a prophet. You know, he was a prophet of his time. And then later, when he would talk about his that that one experience that I just mentioned in Baltimore, he described it differently in all three autobiographies. In the first one, he kind of hinted that that being chosen, he said, I was the first, last and only choice. And there was some sort of intervention, divine intervention that happened. In the second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, he said he called it divine providence in his favor that he was chosen. Hmm. And then in his third autobiography, The Life and Times, which was published after emancipation, he understood that his audience needed a different message. And he didn't describe it as any type of divine intervention at all. In fact, he had a great quote. He said, I prayed for 20 years, but my prayers weren't answered until I prayed with my legs. And so what he was talking about were the first 20 years that he was enslaved. And so the message now to his audience is that they needed to take their own agency. They couldn't continue to pray for a better life in the here and after when they needed to really uh, get to work now. So he really evolved o over that time. Wow. I, you, you're my favorite so far. I just have to tell you, you are my okay. favorite. So tell me this, what do you think the role is for descendants of these historical figures? So like yourself, what, what is the role for you in today's history? Because I, I like that you called him a prophet, but I would go so far as to say that you may be a prophet as well. And so how does that role actualize in real time for you? Hmm. Wow. Oh, gosh. You know, I, I truly believe I don't think about the work that I'm doing. And I don't think that our ancestors, my ancestors really thought about what their legacies would be. And that 150 years from now, we would be looking back and still talking about them. They just did the really important work that needs to be done. And I really don't separate myself as somebody being a descendant of an historic figure, and then I have an obligation to do work because of that. I believe that we all have an obligation um, to do the work, that we all stand on the shoulders and walk in the shoes of those that came before us. And I remember I had a 10-year-old girl say to me one time uh, when I was doing a pre presentation, and she was so excited to share this news with me, and she's bouncing up and down in her chair, and she said, Mr. Morris, Mr. Morris, and she's raising her hand. And I called on her, and she said, I want you to know that I researched my family tree and I found that my great, 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 let's see, that's four greats grandmother, was born into slavery, taught herself to read and write in secret, ran away and became a successful businesswoman and a philanthropist. And she knew exactly what that word meant. And she was really proud to share it with me. And so she said, so, so, so do you know what all of this means? And before I had a chance to respond, she said, it means I have greatness flowing through my veins just like you do. And I will never forget that because we all have greatness flowing through our veins. We all descend from somebody that made a difference. We may have descended from somebody that have given of their lives just for the freedoms that we do have, may have given of their lives just so that some of us have a right to even sit in a classroom and get an education. And when we realize that history is not just about the past, but it's also about the present and the future. And the more that we know where we've come from, the better we can navigate in the world in which we live and the better we'll be able to move forward. And so again, I, I think that we all have a, an, an obligation and we all should realize that greatness is flowing through all of our veins and that history lives in each of us, but the future depends on how we carry that history forward. What will our great, great, great grandchildren say about us 150 years from now in this moment in time? What did we do? That's right. That's right. I think about that often as a grandmother. I certainly try and live a life that allows me to give my grandchildren and great, great grandchildren something good to say when they talk about me. So that is very important. We have yeah. just a little bit of time left. And I know that there are so many people who want to ask questions. And so the first question that we've gotten is this, what are some of the biggest challenges in uh, eradicating human trafficking? So back to the work that you all are doing. The um, people have misconceptions about what trafficking is today. And a lot of that is driven through media and movies. 
that um, really kind of sh don't show it in the way that it, it really is. And I'll go back to the story that I, I talked about, Frederick Douglass hearing his master say that education will unfit him to be a slave. When we were looking at putting our program programming together, we looked at Frederick Douglass as the great abolitionist, and that was his legacy. Booker T. Washington as the great educator, and that was his legacy. Aha, abolition through education. How can we unfit communities to allow slavery to thrive and exist? And so we turned immediately to schools and we've de developed service learning curricula called History, Human Rights and the Power of One. And the Power of One is civic engagement, service mm -hmm. in the community. That program has um, evolved into a program called Protect, which is in partnership with two California-based nonprofit organizations. And it's online training of educators on how to recognize signs of human trafficking and what red flags to look out for. And then they get certified to be able to download and teach age appropriate curricula in the classroom and it's K through 12 education. That program is in more than 30 counties in California. We're in eight states and counting. We're, we're expanding internationally this year into Australia and New Zealand and the Republic of Cyprus and the Mediterranean and sea and, and it's continuing to grow. And so the challenge for us has always been that people tend to react with an abundance of heart first before an abundance of thought. And when you're talking about prevention education and trying to find funding for that, people want to give toward the um, rehabilitation and restoration of victims. And I will always argue that we need more resources for that. But if we don't put some effort on the prevention side, we're, we're not really making any headway. And as well-meaning as we are, we really create this cycle of exploitation where we're, if we're just rescuing, restoring, and rehabilitating, then we're not going to get ahead. And so what prevention education does, it really, it, it stops the um, exploitation by spewing new victims into that cycle of exploitation. So the biggest challenges that we've had is really in the funding, because even foundations that have million dollar grants, they want to know how many victims did you rescue with the money that we gifted you? Mm -hmm. But we've been able to, through federal legislation, we got the um, the original Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which is a piece of legislation that guides how the federal government responds to trafficking domestically and internationally. It was first enacted in 2000, and it gets reauthorized every four years. And the last reauthorization, we were able to get it named for Frederick Douglass and then add prevention, primary prevention language into the legislation and call it the Frederick Douglass Trafficking Victims Prevention and Protection Act. And just by adding that language in there, we were able to get an appropriation of more than $70 million to go to primary prevention education. So we're making some headway and some mm -hmm. progress in that area. I am very hopeful that you know changes that are happening in philanthropy will soon catch up to understand where there are other opportunities to invest. It's not just like you said, on the back end to, to help right. people who have experienced it, but how about we actually help on the front end and prevent folks from having to experience it. So I'm really hopeful that philanthropy will continue to um, learn in the ways that this, this legislation is leading them to, to operate. Another question that we have is if you could have dinner with both of your <laughs> descendants, what would be your first question to each of them? I don't think that I would ask them a question right away, but what I would do is I would give both of them a hug and tell them how proud I am for everything that they've done for uh, the country, for the world, for education, for freedom, and then for our family all of the lessons of love and hard work and humility that have been passed down through the generations. I'm just so very thankful for that. And when I, when I think about them, I'm just so filled with love. And so I would hug them and that would be the first thing that I would do. And then the question that I would probably ask both of them, it would be the same question. And it's a question that I always get all the time. People ask me, what do you think Frederick Douglass or Booker T. Washington would think if they were here today about the state of the world and the state of America? So I would ask them that question. And I would be very interested to hear what they would have to say. 
Well, if I had the opportunity to have dinner with Mr. Frederick Douglass or Booker T. <laughs> Washington, my first question would be, do you know what your great, great, great grandson is going to do? Did you guys <laughs> know what he was going to do? And did you know how much of a difference he would be making in his own path, but using, you know, the strength that you all have imparted in in his DNA. Like, did you have wow. any idea that was going to happen? So that would be my question if I was able to. I love that. that. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that, but you made me think of something else that Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington were friends. And Booker T. had invited Frederick Douglass down to Tuskegee to give the commencement address in 18, I forget the year, but it was 1880 something. And there are letters that we found between the two men where Booker T is promising to pick Frederick Douglass up at the train station and get him back to the train station on time so that he could make it to his next next gig in Montgomery, Alabama. And the last known letter that Frederick Douglass wrote the night before he passed away. So on February 19th, 1895, he wrote to Booker T Washington offering his continued support and awful, also offering money, which he had done for many, many years. So I think it's so uh, cool that they, they didn't know that they would eventually be relatives after they both both passed away, but it's mm -hmm. just so beautiful. That is something. Okay, our I think this might be our last question also, but the next question is what advice would you give, and this is a good one, what advice would you give to us, the, the, the person that's saying this, us as a younger generation to document our history and heritage? Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Uh, Booker T. Washington said, if you want to lift up yourself, lift up someone else. And so really our hope is in the young people, the next generation of leaders in the mold of my ancestors and many others. In the same way that Frederick Douglass understood that technology um, he could use to make his arguments for liberation and equality, young people today hold in their hands, in the palm of their hands through the stroke of a key, they can reach more people than Frederick Douglass could have reached his whole publishing career, publishing three best-selling autobiographies, publishing the North Star newspaper, the Frederick Douglass paper, thousands of essays and articles. And so what I would say to young people is, again, first be interested in your own family tree, your own history. And if you have someone that's a grandmother, a great grandparent, that is still alive, take that phone or that iPad and interview them and videotape them or audio tape them, whatever it is. I just showed my age when I said tape. <laughs> Look, when you said audio, you should, I, I won't even say, I, I was hoping that you would let that ride, but they I couldn't let it go because I realized what I was saying. So uh -huh. when they VHS. Use, use, say VHS that, next. Right, I, I will say that next and a track. Yes. <laughs> But that that's what I, I would say is use that technology and really, um, you know, capture your own family stories, because it may not seem important to you now. But if you do decide to have children one day and your kids come to you and they say, hey, you know, what did my great, great, great grandmother, you know, Anna, who was she? Can you tell me about her? And if you don't have those stories and, and you don't know, then it would really be a shame that your family legacy would end when that information leaves. And I also understand with the legacy of slavery and 400 years of oppression and enslavement and oral history and how, you know, we don't, it, it's harder for us to be able to find information. And those family stories were not always passed down because of the cyclical trauma of that enslavement. But with information is being found all the time and digitized at libraries. And all you really need to do is just to start to do a search and then you'll find a little nugget of information and then you could just pull on that thread and the whole quilt will begin to unravel. And you can, if you try hard enough, you will be able to find information on your family. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is valuable for the younger generation to know uh, is that social media, like you said, it's, I mean, the information is just right there at your fingertips and there's so much that you can share and spread but you one day will be a grandmother or grandfather. Mm -hmm. You one day will be a great grandmother or grandfather. Yeah. And so when your great grandchildren look back, when your descendants go back and find the things that you wrote, you know, what are they going to find? What are they going to find in your, your Snapchats or whatever the stuff is called? Right. You know, your inboxes, your, your messages that are now out on the web for everyone to see forever. 
what will they see of you? So it's it's one thing to, yes, let's look forward and, or I should say, look back to see, you know, how we are connected to our ancestors, but also realize the special, you know, privilege that you have of being someone else's uh, ancestor at some point and, and what they'll find out about you and what they'll take away. That is an excellent point, And I will be using that <laughs> yes. moving forward because, you know, we talk about the internet um, with our human trafficking work and, and we want to make sure that we can reduce the vulnerability of young people to being trafficked for sex and for labor. And a lot of that is happening. The grooming is happening online. So we do have modules in our education that will help parents understand um, how to help their kids navigate the internet and also help kids be safe. But that's a really good point because once you make that digital footprint or imprint, it's going to be there forever. And what will our great, great, great grandchildren say about us when they start Googling or doing whatever, you know, the technology is going to be 150 years from now? That's right. They will do it. Well, I'll tell you this, Mr. Kenneth, I have really enjoyed my time talking with you. Real, I need to meet you in person because I just really have enjoyed getting to know you and know a little bit about your family, about your children, your, your wife, your mother. You kind of touched on all of the pieces that help to humanize you uh, to people who are looking at you as this god of a descendant hmm. because of the work that your, um, your grandparents had done. So thank you so, so much for sharing your family's amazing history. Um, our collective voice is more powerful when we use it together, when we use it together. And I think uh, I will go even so much further to say that we are, we become stronger as people. We become stronger as we learn through the Descendant series. As we learn your stories and learn your ancestors' stories, we get stronger in today, time, right now. And we learn things that help us to move forward. So thank you very, very much uh, for joining us today. Don't say a track to anybody else. Don't say <laughs> Don't say audio, don't say VHS, don't say any of that because by your looks alone, you can pass for about 35. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Okay, that. but once you say that, we know that you get a discount at Denny's. So yeah. thank you so much for being here. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Lanisha. Thank you, Kenneth. Kianta, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed this conversation as well. I look forward to meeting you one day and I would love to flip it and interview you because you've got a lot of wisdom that you've been sharing and I appreciate listen, that. Listen, you. you have, you can do it. Whenever it, it happens, whenever the time is right, we have this on recording because this is another thing that will never go anywhere. I would love for it to be you. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Kenneth Morris, thank you. Wow. This is such an historic moment to be here with you to learn about your ancestry, your legacy, and how you have honored both Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass with your work. We here in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest, we thank you for sharing your words of truth, encouragement, and empowerment. We salute and celebrate you, Kenneth, and we look forward to continuing on this road as we use our lineage and ancestry to empower our community and honor our heritage. Thank you, Kenneth. And Kiantha Duncan, you are remarkable and inspirational in every way. Thank you for moderating this invigorating conversation. We did not want it to end. Thank you for your thoughtful questions, Kiantha, and for your care for such an important history and legacy. And to all of you tuned in, thank you for joining us for NAM's Descendants series. At the Northwest African American Museum, we hope to share inspiring Black stories 365 days a year. Join us in this movement of using Black history, art, and culture to uplift, inspire, unify, and create an equitable future.